Every week, we hear from families and churches and young people themselves who are being drawn back by the Holy Spirit into relationship with God and faith community. So what I want to do here in our just less than hour together is try to share with you what I think is the most important um, practices to do, especially as parents and grandparents, with our young people. Uh, I read the book Essentialism by Greg McCowan. It's actually a, a text at Harvard. It's one of their most popular um, texts and courses. It's called Essentialism, and it's all about like how do we figure out the most important things to do. And there's a phrase in that book that I made a mantra in my life, and our team at the Full Youth Institute, we also made this our, our guiding principle, and that is um, if it's not a definite yes, it's a no. If it's not a definite yes for how we should spend our time and energy, especially in our families, but also in our ministries, then we're not gonna invest resources to do it. I mean, we're all so busy, right? Congratulations for making it here on a Saturday. Like, that's a Herculean feat. To thank you, yes, to get your calendar clear and get here for a Saturday. Oh, good, we have the handout. So we'll go ahead. Maybe, Jono, would you mind helping pass those out, please? Instead of just sitting on the front row. Um, thanks, Jono. So if it's not a definite yes, it's a no. So what I want to share with you is three major categories that our research suggests are, are ultra, uber important for you to focus on with your young people. And the first has to do with how we talk about faith with young people. It has to do with how we talk about faith with young people. Thank you all for passing out those handouts. That's awesome. If I hadn't talked about how to talk to young people about doubt in the previous session, I would be talking about that now. That would be part of the research I would want to share. Do you remember the forward phrase I encouraged when a young person asks you a tough question? I don't know, but. Yeah, I don't know, but. Um, the, other, the other aspect of our research that's really changed how families are talking about faith has to do with um, this research twist. I love it when research brings a twist to our understanding, something new, um, and it's this. When it comes to parent-child faith conversations, as important as it is for parents to ask questions of their kids, it's as important for parents to share their own experiences. So as important as it is for us to ask our kids questions as parents, it's just as important for us to share our own experiences. I'm going to demonstrate. Lori, would you mind standing up for a sec, please? Lori's going to be my kid here for a minute. So, woo! Lori, what's your role at your church? Um, I'm actually an adjunct preacher. Oh, nice. Church. How cool. Yes. Awesome. Ocean Hills. Ocean Hills. Excellent. So, that was uh, a little plug. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Find out more from Lori. I am a teenager. But we're all one church here, right? So, right. Absolutely. So, Lori, you're going to be my kid here for a moment. And here's what we tend to do as parents or grandparents is... When we want to talk to our kid about faith, we ask them questions, especially on the way home from church, right? Um, I certainly did this, you know, elementary, middle school. You know, how was church? What'd you learn? What'd you talk about? Fine, nothing. Yeah, that was that's pretty, You've been in my minivan. That's exactly how many of my <laughs> well, conversations I don't, I don't go. Have to be. Yeah, that's true. You have it yourself in your family. So, as Lori's just well illustrated, you know, those don't generally lead to very generative conversations. Depending on your kid's personality, mood, the relationship you have with them, it might be a decent answer, but in general, it's a pretty short, concise answer, or maybe even some grunts or you know, some leave me alone mom, stepdad eye rolls. So keep asking questions, that's a good thing. But what is as important is not just that I interview my daughter, Lori, but that I share about my own faith journey. And I'll tell you, until our research, Dave and I, you know, every Sunday, we would drive home in our minivan with our kids, and either in the minivan drive home or over lunch, we would ask our kids questions. But we were never sharing, you know, here's what I learned about in the high school ministry today. Or Dave was never sharing, here's what our pastor talked about and what it's got me thinking about. So let's give a hand for Lori, huh? That was so well done. I'm glad you practiced for that and everything, Lori. So, so as important as it is, for us to ask questions, it's just as important that we share our own experience. And that is what parents tend to not do. I like to pray in the mornings. 
Um, and when my kids would come in and see me praying with my Bible and journal, I would think, isn't it great that my kids are seeing me praying? And that's actually true. In fact, sometimes I rearrange my schedule so that my kids see the example of mommy praying, because if not, they won't know that I'm praying out of our research. But I, I previously thought, isn't it great that they're seeing me pray and read the Bible? That's awesome. Yes, true. But now, because of our research, I'm talking with my kids about what I'm praying about, including for them. See, I have prayed for my kids, I did it this morning, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and socially, much of their lives. I've prayed, I pray along those five dimensions for my three kids and my husband, Dave. But until our research, my kids didn't know that that's how I was praying for them. So now, when one of our kids, let's say Jessica comes in and says, Mom, do you know where my shoes are? Before our research, I would have said, yeah, they're down the hall by the laundry. Now, because of our research, I'll say, hey, Jay, um, can I tell you what I'm praying about for you? Can I tell you what I'm reading about in John? How can I be praying for you, Jay? You know that I pray for you physically, emotionally, spiritually, socially. And then I tell her, and Jessica, I think your shoes are down by the laundry. So we eventually get to where the shoes are. But out of our research, when it comes to building sticky faith, I would encourage you to share your spiritual journey with your child. Share your spiritual journey with your child or stepchild. There was a church that was really interested in this research, and so um, they were in, we have these cohorts where churches go through our research over the course of a year. This church was in one of our cohorts. So the youth pastor got deeper into the research, and the youth pastor thought, I'm going to ask everybody going on a short-term missions trip, all the students, all the teenagers going on a short-term missions trip, do you know how your parents became Christians? Do you know how your parents became Christians? 20 kids on the short-term mission trip. Would you like to guess how many of the 20 knew how their parents became Christians? Zero. Zero, exactly. It starts with a Z. Zero. And I'm guessing some of you are thinking, hmm, I'm not sure my kids know about my faith story. I speak to rooms full of pastors, and they come up to me afterwards, and they say, you know what? We've actually never told our kids about our faith story. So look for ways, this is the first principle, first idea. Look for ways to organically and naturally actually share about your spiritual journey. Worship song comes on in the car that you really like, let your kid know why you like it. Just make it something that you're talking about more naturally and organically. Um, Also, when it comes to having good conversations, a lot of families have found some sort of ritual really helps them go deeper in their conversations. Some sort of ritual. Some sort of, we're going to now have a real conversation, and we're signaling to all of us that we're now having a real conversation. So whether it's a family meeting, for our family, we did monthly conversation journals. So at least once a month, Dave and I would get one-on-one time with the kids. We called it Powell time. That's our last name. We'd get one-on-one time with the kids, and we would ask them questions. Our son, Nathan, he's really into sports, especially football. I also grew up watching football. Um, So there's two teams I tend to root for. Let's see how this goes here. Two teams I tend to root for. The Chargers. (laughs) Resounding silence. Okay, maybe this will go a little bit better. The Chargers and whoever's playing the Raiders. Okay, there we go. I got some more agreement there. I'm I'm rooting for the Niners tomorrow. I'm going with California tomorrow. So, uh, oh, got some booze there. Great, awesome. We're one in Jesus. Yay. Um, But so... Monthly conversation journal. So what we, you know, I would say to Nathan, you know, Bud, the Chargers lost this last weekend. What would you say to Philip Rivers if you had a chance to encourage him? I would ask him, what do you think your friends love most about you? If you could change anything about our family, what would you change? How does God tend to speak to you best these days? I would ask those questions, and then he would ask me questions in return. And especially through about middle school, we had these journals, we wrote them down, I'll tell you, if our house went, was going up in flames, truly, those would be the first things I would grab. Pictures are in the cloud. My laptop, all that stuff's saved elsewhere. But those journals, those are priceless. So however you want to do it, our family did it through monthly conversations, however you want to do it, how do you keep honest, authentic conversations going? Out of our research, there's a new phrase. Well, it's not a new phrase, but it's a phrase I'm sure more likely to say these days to my kids, and it's this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 
I mentioned we interviewed over 50 families that are amazing with their kids. And we were starting to see in the data this theme of parents and grandparents being quick to apologize to their kids. So I called one dad. He was a dad of two college students and a high school student. And I said, you know, we had said this was going to be our one hour interview. Is this still a good time? That's our protocol. Um, and he said, oh, I really don't feel like you should be interviewing me. I've had to apologize to all three of my kids in the last 72 hours. And I thought to myself, that's exactly why we want to interview you. Model saying, I'm sorry. There's a picture of a Lego figure to remind me to tell you a story that came up in the course of our research. Um, a mom we were talking to, she was talking about how she interacted with her kindergartner at one point. And this kindergartner, he was just a strong kid. He was also one of those verbal kids like my daughter. And so he, he was just kind of pushing all her buttons and this mom had just had it. And so this mom said angrily, I need you to go to your room. I don't even like you right now, she said to her six-year-old. And she described it later to me as, as he walked to his room, it's like his whole body got smaller because of what she had said. He went to kindergarten and she thought, I've, I've got to make this right. This isn't right. So she went to Target, she got a Lego set, and she wrote him an apology note, just real simple, he's six. I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me, I love you. He came home from kindergarten, she gave him the Lego set and the note. He loved the Lego set, he thanked her for the note. What I haven't told you is this six-year-old is now 21, 22. And the Lego set is long gone. But this mom has helped her son move from, from home to college and back in the summers and all that. And sometimes as she helps him move, she's ran across this note that he's kept for 15, 16 years of his mom apologizing to him. I don't know about you, but what I most need to apologize to my kids for is usually my tone of voice. If you were to read a transcript of what I said, just the words, they're okay. It's the tone of voice that's the problem. We actually, in our family, um, we sometimes make this a question around dinner. What mistake did you make today? What mistake did you make today? Because we want to be able to talk about the mistakes that we make. We want our family to be very comfortable with talking about mistakes. And it's also given us an opportunity to ask forgiveness from each other. Usually for me, it's my tone of voice. And I, one of our teenagers, um, she's really good at pointing out areas I need to grow in. She has that spiritual gift. I ask my kids sometimes, you know, what would you change about my parenting? And two of my kids are like, oh, you know, maybe this or this, but not much. But this one in particular, she's got like an, oh, I just said her gender. I have two girls, so I didn't really reveal. But um, she's got like an alphabetized list of everything she would change about my parenting. And she's caught me at times just a few months ago. There was a problem with her books that she needed to order online for school. And so I was in her room, and we were ordering books, and I had to do it because I needed my credit card and blah, blah, blah. And about 10 minutes into the conversation, she says to me, Mom, you're really sighing a lot. <sighs> now, my daughter knew this, but you don't know this. We had just had a dinner with 70 people from Fuller in our backyard. I was leaving town for the next morning, the next morning for a trip. And my daughter came to me at like nine o'clock at night with this need for online book ordering. <sighs> and everything in me wanted to say, hey, you know what, babe? You came to me at nine o'clock the day before I need to leave. We just had 70 people walk out of our backyard. You know, give me a break. But instead, I just said, you know what? You're right. You're right. And I don't, I don't want to treat you that way. I'm sorry. And I'll work on it. Here's what we hear from parents. The way that we respond in those moments tell our kids how we're gonna respond in other moments when the problems are even bigger. And so how do we take a posture of apologizing and repenting 
instead of defending and explaining. So that's some of the most important research. If you're going to say yes, if what's the definite yes, it's apologizing, it's having conversation rhythms, it's making sure you share your own faith journey. Here's the second thing that I want you to say a definite yes to out of our research. A definite yes to time. Time, time, time. The time you spend with your young person. Is there a problem with the handouts? No? Okay, a lot of you were holding them up. You're just flipping them over? Okay, great. Just wanted to make sure. Um, some of you look a little confused, so I'm glad we're all good. Um, saying a de yeah, awesome. So, anybody still need a handout? Great. Oh, we're well. Oh, no, no, no. There's a few people up here, please. Thank you. So, definite yes to the time that we spend with our young people, which begs a question. A lot of researchers and practitioners have asked this Is it about quantity time or is it about quality time? Well, I like this answer from my friends Reggie Joyner and Carrie Newhoff. They say it's the quantity of quality time that really counts. It's not quantity or quality, but it's the quantity of quality time we spend. The Search Institute has studied young people's sparks. Young people's sparks, meaning young people's passions, abilities, interests. I've already told you that our son, he's really into football. Um, what are some of the other things that the young people in your lives are into or good at? Video games, Video games. what else? Music? Ca cards? Art, art. Uh, uh, I'm not so great at art, which is betrayed by my inability to hear the word art. So yes, art. Cooking, awesome. Sports, Sports Boy Scouts, piano. I mean, there's so many things that our young people are into. Um, and when we spend our time, one of the best ways that we can spend our time is by supporting young people in what they're passionate or gifted in. One study by the Search Institute of Teenagers Nationwide indicates that only about 55% of teenagers feel like they have an adult who supports them in their sparks. Only 55%, just more than half, feel like they have an adult who's spending time with them in what they care about. Now, in one of our books on sticky faith, um, we went into some uh, related research, and it's probably generated more conversation, especially with dads and stepdads, than anything else in the book, and it's this. A study that shows the toxic effects of favoritism, the toxic effects of favoritism in a family. That when a young person perceives, perceives favoritism in the family, that the parent, the step-parent, the grandparent, likes one kid more than the other, that kid who feels like they're not the favorite tends to distance themselves from that adult as well as anything that's important to that adult. So when our kids perceive, and by the way, it's all about our kids' perception. It's not about what we think we're communicating, it's about what they are receiving, which is true across the board in family research. It's not about what we think, it's about what the kid thinks that really makes a difference in terms of um, the variables that are affected. So there's a lot of dads and stepdads who have come to me and said, you know what? It's really easy to cheer for my son or daughter who's into sports. Like, I know how to support that. My kid who's into horseback riding, I don't know how to support that. I mentioned earlier, I, I am not into art. Um, my least favorite store on the planet truly is Michael's. The arts and crafts supply store, like it's disorganized and cluttered and at least in Pasadena, there's always a long line. Like I would rather vacuum than go to Michael's. That's how much I just don't like Michael's. Uh, Dave, my husband, he came into our marriage with two glue guns. I came into our marriage with zero glue guns, okay? So I'm just not an arts and craft person. Our youngest Jessica is. I've tried to talk her into watching football with me, but that so far hasn't worked so well. So I'll say, well, since we're not watching football on a Sunday, um, hey, Jay, you, know, you want to play games? No, Mom, it's okay. Hey, Jay, you want to go for a walk? No, Mom, it's okay. I like trying this with my kids. Hey, you want to sit next to me and we can both read? No, Mom, that's okay. So then I know what I have to do. Oh, I sigh, right. <laughs> Try not to sigh. Hey, Jay. Want to do an arts and crafts project? Yeah, Mom, that would be great. 
and we either go to Michael's or she rounds up some supplies or we look online. It, truly, housework is better than doing art, arts projects from where I'm sitting. But out of our research, I've realized I've got to every once in a while go in the van to Michael's with Jessica and do some coloring and do some painting and do some cutting and all that kind of stuff. Because I don't want my, I don't want any of my kids to think, well, yeah, mom, mom connects with a kid who likes football. But the ones of us who don't, she doesn't really connect with. So that's what some of the, to me, most convicting research says. Now, how do we live this out? How do we actually spend our time? Um, family dinners. This was a theme in our research, how much families try to prioritize dinner. Now, having said that, with three busy teenagers, I know it's really hard to get everybody at the table at the same, same time, between sports and debate practice and worship practice and small group and all that sort of stuff. And plus, if your experience is like mine, sometimes when you sit together, it's not exactly like a sweetness and light, focus on the family, crate and barrel, courier and Ives moment. I mean, sometimes family dinner doesn't quite unfold like maybe we hope. Family, family meals, a great time to connect with kids. But again, sometimes that doesn't work. Um, out of our research, parents have really prioritized bedtime as a time to have meaningful conversations with kids. And sometimes your kids will open up to you at bedtime in ways that they won't at other times. My husband is a master at our kids' bedtimes. I'm not so great at it. I'm a morning person. So like talk to me at six in the morning, awesome. Talk to me at 10 in the night, I'm barely coherent. And so, I mean, confessions, I've actually prayed with my kids like as they're brushing their teeth because I'm just that eager to get them to bed. So um, I'm, I'm not very good at this. Dave, you know, gives them back rubs and they have these meaningful conversations. He goes to tuck our kids in. We still tuck our teenagers in even though they stay up way later than we do. Um, it's just kind of the idea of some closure time to the day. And I mean, he can be gone truly like 45 minutes tucking in all three kids. I'm like four and a half minutes. So um, I just do a lot quicker. I'm not as good at it. And I share that to say that I'm gonna give you a bunch of ideas today and you figure out what works best for you and your kids. And you're gonna have some strengths and your spouse might have different strengths. Um, but think about how bedtime, if that's a, a time that's strong for you, could be meaningful. Um, a lot of families have, and again, try to have a rhythm with time. They try to figure out how do we make sure we're connecting with our kids in a really systematic way. I love what one family's done. Um, my daughter's birthday is May 8th. I mentioned that earlier. And so what, this, what we heard from this family is the 8th of every month, one parent takes out that child one-on-one, -on -one, just to make sure they're getting one-on-one -on -one time. And you know, as you have more and more kids, it's harder to get one-on-one -on -one time. So how can you create rhythms and rituals in your calendar, especially like every month to get that kind of time? Family game nights, family game nights. This just came up so much in our research. Um, whether it's cards, whether it's video games, old school, new school, whatever it might be, there's something about family game nights that um, seem to be powerful ways for families to spend time together. Our family's really into charades these days and Rummy Cube. I mean, we're pretty old school right now and we play those games whenever we have a chance, get critical mass with three or more of us. Parents were very intentional in using car time. Really intentional in using car time. And I know, especially once your kid gets a device, car time can be challenging because they're pretty focused on that device. Uh, something that's worked well for us is our kids get in the car and often they've been someplace where they can't look at their phone um, because they've been at sports practice or school or wherever it might be where they can't look at their phone and so they'll get in the car and we'll say something like, hey, you know what, why don't you check your phone for the first five, six minutes, but then we'd like, can we go ahead and have a conversation? Um, and so far they've been okay with that because we feel like we're giving them that first time that they need. This is so, relevant here at the Santa Barbara Mission Conference. Also, what we've seen in the research is the power of families serving together. The power of families serving together. Often in our churches, you know, the mom stepmom goes one way to serve, the dad stepdad goes another way to serve, and kids are serving in their age segregated, age stratified ministries. And that's okay, it's not terrible. But the problem is the family is never serving together. 
And so Diana Garland, um, who's recently passed away, but out of Baylor, she's done some great research on how serving together gives a unique opportunity for that experience and for the conversations before and after. So what does it look like for your family to serve together? That can be hands-on service, you know, look at your church's calendar and figure out what is it that we can already, that our church is already doing that we can participate in. Some months for our family, uh, we sponsor a compassion child. And so we're just a little bit more thoughtful about we all write pictures or notes to Tiziani and maybe, you know, collect money for her birthday or Christmas or whatever it might be. And sometimes that's the way our family serves that month. So whether it's hands-on or whether it's something like that that's more virtual, how can we help our families serve together? Now, I'm guessing that at least one of you is asking this question. What if my child doesn't want to spend time with me? That's, that's a real question. That's real. That's totally real. Um, what if my child doesn't want to spend time with me? Well, I wish I could sit with you and really talk in depth about it, but I probably won't have a chance to do that. So instead, what I would say is, I, I want to tell you the story of this mom I met uh, in the Bay Area, actually, here in California. Single mom, raising a son, teenage son, and the teenage boy did not really want to spend time with her. She would say, hey, you want to go out to eat? No, mom, it's okay. Hey, you want to go shopping? No way, mom, I do not want to do that. She couldn't figure out how to connect with her boy. But then she realized the one thing he loved more than anything else was movies. He loved movies. And they would have their best conversations going to a movie and sometimes coming home, even more often coming home from a movie. This mom didn't really like movies. She didn't like film. But she became a student of film because of what it meant to her son. And she would look for movies that, you know, especially had some kind of spiritual themes that she might be able to tease out. But really, she would just go with her son to any movies he was open to going to, to get the time and hopefully to get some conversation, focusing on his sparks. Sometimes this wise mom, she would choose a movie theater that was geographically further than needed to be so that she would have longer time in the car with her boy. So if your kid or your, your grandkid doesn't seem to want to spend time with you, one of my first questions would be, what are they into? And how can you support them and spend time with them doing that? There's some kind of transition that happens at some point in elementary school when it's not so much our kids entering our world, but how do we enter their world? So we've talked about how do you say a definite yes to what's most important when it comes to your conversations? How do you make sure you're prioritizing in the midst of your busy family schedule, what kind of time is most important? I'm saying things like service. I'm saying things like good conversation in the car. Um, I'm saying things like um, things that are your kids' sparks. And then last, Saying a definite yes to building a team. I have good news. Parenting is not a solo sport. Parenting is not a solo sport. And if you're here today, if you're part of a faith community, if you simply just want some help parenting, I want to share with you this research twist. We, when we studied the 500 youth group graduates during their first three years in college, we wanted to see, you know, what is it that the youth group does that is particularly valuable? What is it that the youth group does that really seems to bring results in kids' lives? So you'll be glad to know that of the 13 youth group variables we looked at, things like studying scripture was correlated with mature faith in high school and college. Serving was correlated with mature faith in high school and college. A lot of what we do in church and youth group was correlated with mature faith in high school and college. But of the 13 youth group participation variables we looked at, the one that was most correlated with mature faith in high school and college was intergenerational relationships and worship. That should make you say, wow. wow. Yeah, okay. That was kind of, it built, but yes, that was a pretty good wow by the end. Yeah, wow, wow. If you think about what churches do, we've divided up the ages. We've, and this is not a verb I use lightly, we've segregated the ages. And now let me just say, there is a time and a place for age-based ministry. I like being with people who are going through sometimes what I'm going through. 
And as one youth leader told me, you know, the average 16-year-old doesn't want to talk about pornography with grandma in the room. And grandma doesn't really want to be there either. So that, that works for everybody. So there's a time and a place for focused conversations related to an age group and the unique issues, challenges, and opportunities of the age group. But one of my life mantras is that balance is something we swing through on our way to the other extreme. In our effort to offer relevant and meaningful ministry to young people, we've ended up siloizing them from the rest of the church. And so that's where you already heard me talk about, but I just want to really hit home on the, the five to one ratio, this idea from Chap Clark, that instead of having one adult for five kids, what if we surrounded each kid with five adults? Sometimes when I talk about intergenerational relationships, I, I talk about growing up at Grandma and Grandpa Ekman's house. That's my maiden name. And they had five kids who all got married. I'm the oldest of over a dozen cousins on that side. And so when we'd come together, there were way too many of us for Grandma and Grandpa to put us around one table at Easter or Christmas or Thanksgiving. So they created two tables. The adults' table and the kids' table. I see you being at Grandma and Grandpa Ekman's house also. Yes. The adults' table and the kids' table. And we've created that same mentality in our churches. And what's interesting about this clip, I actually like toward the very end of the clip where it gets kind of chaotic. And one kid, Max, is grabbing the gavel and adults are trying to stop him and it's kind of cacophonous and loud and crazy. Because that's what happens when everybody gets around the table. It is more disruptive. It's more, if you have kids at your table, it's just plain more messy. But what we've seen in our research is it's so worth it, not just for the young people, but for those of us who are over 32. I'll tell you, one of the best ways to invigorate your faith and your life is to spend time with someone under 30. And so for us as parents and grandparents and mentors to think about what's the team, what's the five-person team we're developing around our young person. Now, let me just say this. There's some research support for the idea of five adults in a kid's life, but one adult in a kid's life is great. Two is great. Three is great. However many it works that are involved in that kid's life and are involved is intergenerational mentors. Intergenerational mentors. Now, what was interesting in our research is when we asked young people, who are the adults that you know, are mentoring you or on your team, et cetera, it was often people that their parents knew. It was that woman that their stepmom goes walking with the first Friday of every month. It was the man that their dad has coffee with. It was a neighbor. It was a friend, from, a friend of their families from church. So here's the good news that I want to give you is I'm not asking you to go develop a bunch of new relationships as a family. I'm just saying, who are the relationships that your family already has, the adults who are already building relationships with kids, and how do you turn the dial a few clicks on those relationships? And by the way, you don't need to keep this a secret from your kids. We talk with our kids about this. We've asked our kids, especially when they were younger, under 12, we would ask them, you know, who are some adults that you'd like to get to know better? And sometimes those adults were babysitters. And when we needed a babysitter, we'd call one of those adults because we figured, hey, these are the adults our kids want to be around. We need a babysitter. This is like a win, win, win. We don't have to keep the secret from our kids. We can find out from our kids who they are already connected with, already want to spend time with, already maybe want to be like a little bit through intergenerational mentoring. Intergenerational groups are also taking off around the country. I've been in women's groups, I've been in couples groups, but I'll tell you the richest groups that I've been in have been intergenerational groups. When there's birth to 70 in the same room talking. Is it more messy? Yes, it is. And sometimes, you know, we divide up a little bit. Kids go one place, adults go another place, because there are some things that it's good to talk about with just your age. But what would it look like for you to start being more intentional with another family or two or some single people or some senior adults and create some kind of intergenerational grouping in the midst of your family routine? If you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed at the idea of this, if you're not sure where to turn 
for the adults that can invest in your kids, I'll tell you, there's one group of adults with untapped potential to invest in kids. It's this group. It's senior adults. Senior adults. I wish I had a more researchy word. There's just a tenderness between teenagers and senior adults. I think there's a fair amount of senior adults in Santa Barbara, right? This is a wonderful opportunity for those of us who have not quite hit that age yet to think about who, what's a, who's a senior adult or two I could help build a relationship with my kids and with our family. And by the way, for those of you who are senior adults, let me share with you what one grandparent told me after hearing about this research. He said, his, he was here in Southern California, his grandkids were scattered across the country, and he said this, you know what, I've been praying for God to bring adults into my grandkids' lives, because, you know, I can't see them as much as I'd like to, so I've been praying for adult, for God to bring adults into my grandkids' lives. And he said, he looked at me and he said, maybe I'm supposed to be some other grandparents' answer to prayer for a kid in this church. So you who are senior adults, what would it look like for you to show up at a volleyball match, for you to come to a Boy Scout event, for you to cheer on a young person. Out of my experience, when it comes to really building and highlighting these relationships, I think there are often some really natural transitional times to let that young person know, here are the adults who are important to you. For us, we did something when our kids became teenagers, literally turned 13. Others do it at 16. 18, high school graduation, kindergarten graduation, whatever it looks like to help kids start understanding, oh yeah, these are the adults to make that really tangible. 